Hey guys, how's it going? Kevin Goatees here, gutting the sacred cow. You know, this streak of having films fall in our laps that are just absolutely beloved continues. Jared Polini joins Kevin Israel and myself as he decided to try and climb Fort Eddie Murphy's walls and assail Beverly Hills Cop. Beverly Hills Cop. Wow. Well, let's see if he can do it. But before we get to it, guttingthesacredcow at gmail.com. That's where to find us. You know that if you want to advertise with us. And of course, guttingthesacredcow.com for some merch, for some good old hoopla shenanigans. And of course, the joke community room on the metaverse. You know what? Let's just jump right into it. Jared Bellini going after Eddie Murphy's Beverly Hills Cop. A hospital? What's that? It's a big building with patients, but that's not important right now. Kevin Israel, name that film. Just want you to know, we're all counting, oh, counting on, you. on you. All right. <laughs> that was a softball. Thanks for thanks for giving me an easy one. <laughs> after after these, I, people just think I don't actually watch movies. <laughs> I was gonna Mayday, Mayday. What's that? Mayday's a big parade. It celebrates the Russian New Year. Have big balloons and a parade. <laughs> I thought about doing that one. Kevin Goatee, Kevin Israel, back. Here we go, kids. Gutting the sacred cow. Wowie, zowie. We have had an absolute cavalcade of top-notch films selected by our guest, Batman 1989. Was one of them. Back to the Future. Office, Office Space was our live show. X-Men Days of Future Past. A ton of film. The Warriors, people were out crying for. Films that people have loved over years, but our guest has said, nay, sirs. And today is no different. As our guest today, Jarrett Bellini, joins us to take down, wow, I would say an 80s cornerstone. Jarrett, how are you? Welcome to the show. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Jared, before we get in, tell the fine folks what you're up to, where we can find you. Uh, I am mostly spending my time on Twitter, which is a terrible idea, but that's where you can find me for the most part. Uh, I spend way too much time on there, and, uh, and I'm no better for it. Jared has selected Beverly Hills Cop. Pausing for effect. What? Yeah. 1984, a budget of $13 million. A box office haul of $316 million. Turn that into 2022 money. $36 million budget, $877.4 million. Can you imagine making $300 million off a $13 million? That's fucking insanity. Yeah. <laughs> That's why they had to make a third film because they go, ah, we're going to capitalize on the goodwill and make it PG-13, thus breaking my rule of sequels. Da uh, Jarrett, my sequel theory is quite simple. One, you cannot have a sequel where the original is an R and then the sequel is a PG-13. It does not work out. Second, you cannot have the original and the sequel have more than 10 years time lapse between. Bad time. Are there a lot of films that went R to PG-13? More than you would care to ever hope. Is it just not necessarily direct sequels, but it. usually later in the in the franchise, they'll sometimes switch. No, huh. I, I found a lot of them do go immediately. I'd say I should, a good chunk. I'd almost say 40 percent have gone R to PG-13. Uh, I will give a few examples. Uh, Police Academy is one. Uh, then another one, let me think. Revenge of the Nerds. I knew you were going to say that. I was yeah. wondering about that. One. Yeah. yeah. RoboCop two to three. Well, that's later, but okay. But yeah, I, I got to, I got to really got to kick back and think, but there are a, a good amount that went from R to PG 13 and that's a, and it's because of greed. Yeah. Don't go for the kids. Keep it real no. up in the, the field. What about the opposite? Dude, is there an opposite to that? A PG 13 that went to an R? I've never heard of it. I, I don't think that exists. Google me wrong if you dare, but I am pretty All goddamn right. sure that that is the case. I can't imagine. I don't even. That's like a bit. That's like a business strategy that just wouldn't make sense. That would be like, hey, we're going to open a business in a town where there's no people that like anything that we sell. We think this is going to work. Like, yeah. I, yeah. Let's open a left handed store in a rural part of America. <laughs> IMDB, as we all know, is a scale 1 through 10 with decimal points. Let's go to our guest, Jared Bellini. What do you think Beverly Hills Cop scored on the old IMDB? I'm guessing like a 7.2 because everything on that site seems to be a 7 point something. That's very true. Kevin Israel, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that was a, that was a good guess. I was going to go in the low 7s. 
Um, I'll up him a little. I'll go seven, eight. Seven, four. Ooh. You What's two, baby. You two bloodhounds are hot on the trail. <laughs> Kevin Israel, Rotten Tomatoes, of course, is a one through 100 score. What do you think the critics gave Beverly Hills Cop? Uh, I have a feeling that I, I'm always wrong when I have this hunch, but I'm going <laughs> I'm I'm to think it's, I'm going to go low. I'm going to go 67. Jared. Ooh, it's got to be higher than that. I think because of the nostalgia, people like this film. I think it's like 86, something like that. 83. Wow. Oh, God damn. My hunch Jared, is wrong. Uh, Jared, what did the audience give Beverly Hills Cop? I bet it's similar. I don't think it's going to sway too much from the uh, the critics. 80, 87. Kevin Israel? I'll go 86. 82. Critics and audience, damn near simpatico. Wow. Quotes? Line them up. Kev's just going to read off the whole script. Okay? <laughs> so if you want to go take a pee or something. Yeah, no. So this I is have... funny that you're about to read off these quotes because this will get into my very first argument as to why this is a terrible movie. But go ahead. There are, yourself. There, there are a lot of them that are off the beaten path, which have stood the test of time. Nah, man, I'm from Buffalo. <laughs> my all-time favorite one. I know what, I know what this is going to be. And I know my, what it's going to be. And my daughter can says... Can I say it? Wait. You, yeah, can of course I say you it? can. Of course you can. This isn't my locker. This is not my locker. <laughs> Paul and, Reiser. And then the second one, this is not my office. You damn right it's not. <laughs> and with the exception of Cleveland, this has the worst security in the nation. Is this the man who wrecked the buffet at the Harrow Club? I forgot about this one, and this cracked me up hard. Can you park this in a good spot? All this shit happened the last time I was here. That was a good one. That's a good one. That is a good one. <laughs> tell, tell Ramon from the club, went to the clinic and found out he is tested for herpes simplex 10. I left a lot of the obvious ones out there. I know you boys, you're just going to pick them right up. Kevin Israel, why don't you uh, come you on? Know, I, I don't think I went for obvious ones. All right. Disturbing the peace. I got thrown out of a window. What's the fucking charge for getting pushed out of a moving car, huh? Jaywalking? Jaywalking? Bullshit. <laughs> this is the cleanest and nicest police car I've ever been in in Sorry. my life. This thing's nicer than my apartment. apartment. I was going to write that one down, too, but I didn't. That was an easy one. And, <laughs> well, you do eat a lot of red meat. <laughs> Jared, how about you? Have any? Uh, the red what? meat one is good, but the only one that actually makes me laugh in this entire film is very early on. It's in the very opening scene when he says, he's talking about the cigarettes. He says, these are very popular cigarettes with the children. Yeah. <laughs> I love that line. And honestly, that's the only one that really makes me laugh. Wow. Five fun facts. Five we all know Sylvester Stallone was going to play Axel five Foley five up until right two now. weeks before Stop two weeks before facts. shooting, five causing the production right company, now. production team, excuse me, to rewrite on the fly in order for Eddie Murphy to step into the role. The legend is Stallone abandoned the project thanks to failed negotiations over what type of orange juice was to be kept in his trailer. Come on. Yeah, I know. The official explanation was that Stallone's script made the budget skyrocket and Paramount did not want to spend all the extra money. I don't think I buy either of those. Back to number two fun fact. When director Martin Brest was offered the job by Jerry Bruckheimer, he was lukewarm on the project. So he flipped a coin to decide whether or not to do it. When the, when the film became a huge success, Brest had the quarter that he used framed. He still had that quarter. Come Call on. it, friendo. I was just going to say, I smell it coming. Someone's going to make a no, a no country joke. I'm your Huckleberry. That's the, uh, is, all, is also, is that Scrooge McDuck's like lucky quarter version for him? Lucky dime, <laughs> lucky dime. Lucky. Yeah, it was his first dime. Work smarter, not harder. Harder. Woohoo! Among the directors that turned down the more serious script were, one, two, I'll give you a guess. Two, get two directors. One is a fucking titan. The other one, I'll be shocked if you get his name in the near future. One's an absolute can't-miss bona fide pioneer. The other, known but not that well-known. Ridley Scott. No. Israel? Mm -hmm. 
Richard Donner. No. Martin Scorsese. What? Yeah. Jeez. And David Cronenberg. David Cronenberg would have made a very different film. That would Scorsese. I know. I know. Has Scorsese ever made a comedy? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, Irishman. That was hilarious watching him curb yeah. stomp out with uh, Robert De Niro and an 80-year-old man trying to do it in real time. That was hilarious. That was so uncomfortable. Well, I guarantee there would be no nah, 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 if he did that because it would be all Rolling Stone songs. Okay, now three guesses besides Stallone. Who else was attached to this project? I'll give you a hint. All tough guys. All very – two of them were monsters – in the 70s and 80s. One was a monster in the 80s and kind of quieted down that then reemerged in the late 2000s, in the 2000s. Two were monsters in the 70s and one was a monster even in the 80s as well. A third monster in the 80s disappeared and then reemerged in the late 2000s. Clint Eastwood. No. We have him, Dirty Harry and Axel Foley. That's a fucking. Well, it's a cop movie. That's yeah. what I'm going. Yeah, with. Gauntlet and all that. Yep. Yeah. Is your adventure a guess? I got nobody. Mickey Rourke. I would have never gotten that. James no. James Khan. And Al Pacino. I was gonna say Pacino or De Niro. That would seem too ridiculous. Yeah. It actually seemed a little bit too obvious. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyone threw me out of a goddamn window. <laughs> Number four, the movie was the highest grossing R-rated comedy of all time until, take a guess what R-rated comedy knocked it off its perch. Ooh. I'll give you a hint. It was pretty recent. Uh, last 15 years or so. Well, last 15, I was going to say American Pie. but I have no idea. Hangover? The hangover it is. Oh. <laughs> Attaboy. Number five, because of the movie's repeated production delays and his scheduled trip to Florence, Italy, Bronson P. Show grew restless and said if they didn't start a production, they didn't start production, he would have to drop out. He made this ultimatum despite being a virtual unknown. I was going to say, did he have any leverage? <laughs> this is way before <laughs> Balky and Perfect Strangers. <laughs> and Second Sight with John Laroquette. Now, well, I actually have a, a, a Bronson uh, fun fact for you that I was going to say for later, but this seems like the appropriate time for it. It is. Please do. So he seemed really familiar when I was watching it. I'm like, where do I know this guy from? He, and so I IMD beat him and I have no idea anything else he's been in. Like, I actually don't know who he is, but among his movies on his list was something called Kung Fu and Titties. Oh, Kung he Fu plays and a Titties? character called The Beaver in a movie called Kung Fu and Titties. And so being that I wanted to be prepared for this, I went ahead and watched it. It's available on, <laughs> <laughs> it's available on Tubi with commercials. Of course it is. Yeah. You stroke your Tubi. <laughs> and it's, uh, don't watch it without hallucinogens. It's oh. the weirdest thing ever. I didn't make it all the way through, uh, but you will get Kung Fu and you will get titties. Wait, you didn't know, you didn't know Perfect Strangers? I guess I didn't make that connection. I was looking at his films. Maybe that was Oh, okay. It. Did yeah. you also not forget True Romance, where he was the uh, the coke, uh, the, the acting buddy of Michael Rappaport in True Romance? I didn't remember that. I oh. still need to see that movie. God damn, you haven't seen that? <laughs> you we, watched... sat down to, we sat right. down to watch it one night, and I actually think that was the night our power went out. We were oh, like really? set to watch it, and the power went out. <laughs> True Romance, Brain Donors. Watch those this week. I, brain some... Donors is the other one. When we were sitting down to watch True Romance, I was like, there's another one. And I was going to text you, but then the power went out. I was like, there's another movie, Goatee, always says I got to watch. Brain Donors, right? I mean, you keep watching these shitty Netflix films that we do on our Patreon account. And people are like, why, do they, why does he keep watching He keeps giving shit? me great shit to complain about. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Now it's time for everybody on the internet to ra rabble, or ra rabble around, rally around, and... Get out those knives, spears, whatever. Here we go. And now time for Ask a Gutter at Bango2331. By the way, he listened to our new episode and not even 30 minutes after I released it, Kevin Israel. What a super fan. Beverly Hills Cop is a fucking gem. Jared has quite the tall task ahead of him. Mm -hmm. Not a question. 
Not a uh, question. Lord Snurts, is there a better or more catchy soundtrack for an 80s action movie? Hmm. Oof. Well, Top Gun. I wouldn't call that action. Oh, that's an action movie. Uh, does not... Action, if you really want to be... This doesn't qualify as an action film in my book. Action film would be Terminator. Anything Schwarzenegger still owned Van Damme or Seagal. And Dolph Lundgren's B-shit. This is not a true action film. This is more of a comedy drama. Buddy cop drama. I wouldn't we'll call get, this action. We'll get into that okay. a little bit more. <laughs> but anyway, answer the question. Is there, a better, is there a better... How about a better 80s soundtrack than this? Footloose, Dirty Dancing... Oh, you lost me with those first two, so it looks like we'll be digging out from the hole already, Kevin Israel. Uh, the Big Chill. I mean, the Big Chill is Forrest Gump from the 80s. All this is a, is a collection of great songs. They go, let's sell some albums. Let's sell this record the old-fashioned way by just compiling the shit out of it. Not kind of setting any kind of original themes, just cheating. What about Cocktail? You got Kokomo out of that. I wish we didn't. <laughs> I, I'm going to throw one out there. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Virtually all unknown artists on there. Except six six butt neck butt, I think that's a fantastic one. Okay, that's not my question. It's for the gutters question. Fuck yourself, Kevin. Next, uh, rat race. Oh, Almighty Ray race the Candace. I bet there is a chance that Beverly Hills Cop is slow enough to be boring and not hold up. It's been too long though. Good choice for the gutting. The question: Who's your favorite fictional cop or fictional cop? You put. Uh, I it, I would say Lenny Briscoe. Law and Order. Oh, wow. Yeah, cool. Jerry Orbach. He was a good cop. Uh, or uh, Bunk Moreland from The Wire. You know, those are two answers I couldn't have fucking had 18,000 monkeys with yeah. typewriters nope. come up with. But nonetheless, solid choices. The Something Something cast, STSD guys, be honest, which one of you would have this in your megalomaniac man cave? It's the uh, artwork <laughs> where Axel Foley looks in and sees the ro the heads on rotating plates in the art gallery. Zyphos thinks it's me. He's wrong. My man cave will have old school video games, pool table, fat, a huge TV, uh, of course, including the Spy Hunter sit-down version because I'm a gentleman. And uh, that's pretty much the gist. Oh, of course, posters to my favorite films. Sure, but not, but not the, but not the rotating heads. I'm not, uh, I'm not ostentatious like that. I don't think anybody wants that. No, no. How about you, Jared? Anything from that? No, I don't need any of that stuff in my, uh, my man cave. Noted at Nemorovsky. More guitars. Yeah, just yeah. more guitars. Not even that. I want the the most comfortable uh, couch possible, a really good blanket, and a TV, and then I'm absolutely happy. I don't need anything else. What are you on the run from the man out of a log cabin in the woods? <laughs> yes, that would be wonderful. I accept. <laughs> uh, Nemorowski asked, what's your favorite Eddie Murphy movie? And you answered, Coming to America is the correct answer. It's true. Well, Coming to America was done on this very podcast about a year ago. So you might want to give that a hate listen, if you will. Next question, Ken Bjorn Turner. What wonder what Axel F. did for Casio sales after Beverly Hills Cop came out? I'll answer. It sure affected a young Kevin Goatee because I had a Casio SK-1, probably because of this film. Did you play? Uh, I can't. Yes, I did. I played the first. And I couldn't get the. But the basic part. Show off. <laughs> yeah. Joker is from Smash Brothers. Axel Foley in Detroit under the management of OCP and becomes the next RoboCop? Oh, yeah, boys. My mind just went there. <laughs> Can you imagine that? That was a stretch. RoboCop and Axel Foley taking out Ed 209. Ed 209. Dick, you're fired. <laughs> 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 All right, that does it for Ask a Gutter. Kevin Israel, I think it's time to let Jared Bellini come out and try and shove a banana in the tailpipe of Beverly Hills Cop. So let's have him gut. Gut. The, the sacred, sacred cow. cow. All right. So uh, I, I think I'm just going to start by saying it's just not that funny for starters. Okay. Uh, you kind of already did iconic lines. I didn't know uh, that you would hit them right off the bat, but really are those what you consider iconic lines? Because to me, they're not. There's a couple <laughs> lines, but they're not ones that we all remember. Are they really that good? Come on. 
we'll answer in our in our notes. Oh, okay. That's how this works. I just talk and then uh, and then you destroy me afterward. All right. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's really not even a good iconic scene. There's like these occasional moments um, that stand out. I guess like the strip club scene is kind of funny, but there's really no super iconic scene. But we'll get back to that scene in a second because the other thing is this. We don't even know what kind of film this is. It doesn't know what it wants to be. It's not an action movie, as we've already discussed. Uh, it's not some heady crime drama. It's not a James Bond you know, thriller, even though it tries to be with all these henchmen. Uh, it's really not a good buddy cop comedy. It's trying to be all of these things. And in the process of trying to be all of them, it becomes none of them. So it doesn't even know what it wants to be. This was just a vehicle for Eddie Murphy to make his laugh uh, that we all know and to be charming, which he is. He is charming. I will give him that. Um, okay, next thing. Uh, the music is trash, okay? I'm wow. saying this. the music is trash. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it was like, for what it was for its time, the synth pop stuff, it was cool. I will give Axel F an okay. That being said, everything else is awful. Um, so like the, the opening track, this might be more of a, a, a personal thing, but I hate 80s saxophone music. Like I can handle- So you hate 80s music, period. <laughs> pretty much, no. I mean, I can take cool jazz saxophone or like the big man in Springsteen saxophone. That I don't mind, but when it's like this bad 80s, so we get it on the opening track, The Heat Is On, which is a terrible song about nothing. Uh, it's Glenn no, Fly. it's about the heat is on. It's on the street. That's what it's about. Oh, is that what it's about? <laughs> you don't yeah. have to read too deep for this one. Beside your yeah. hair, beside your feet. Come on. It's a terrible song. He was doing weird stuff outside of the Eagles, and it's a bad song. And then beyond that, the other tracks are just sort of misguided. Um, okay, so we've got Axel Foley's just been concussed. His best friend was just murdered smash cut to him driving down the street in LA to Patti LaBelle stirred up and it's all feel good. That's a terrible decision right there. How do you go from I'm concussed, my friend is dead, good times in LA. Bad decision right there. I guess um, 80, 85 and sunny cures all forms of uh, post-concussion syndrome. And never mind the friend that is, his friend is dead. Uh, there was one other one. I think it's the car chase. In fact, this goes into the next one. It's um, the action sequences are terrible. They're totally hokey. Um, the car chase. I timed it, okay? The opening car chase with the truck with all the cigarettes. We know. It's, it's exactly three minutes, okay? That is too long for a bad car chase, okay? Uh, the pro Basically, they took the song. It was the Neutron Dance by the Pointer Sisters, and they made a <laughs> car chase to it. That is not a car chase song. The sound effects were made by like some child with a Fisher Price microphone, really terrible sound effects. And I really think they took the Neutron Dance. They're like, oh, this is a three minute radio song. Thus, our car chase must be three minutes. <laughs> and it's, it feels like it just goes on for no reason. Like, oh man, the truck is still going. Oh, let's just put something in front of it to smash. Oh, more cars to smash. It's a pointless car chase. Also, I'm still trying to figure out the driver of that. I still haven't figured out who he was exactly and why he was in the truck. That part, actually, maybe maybe I'm just missing something, but something seemed off there. I don't know why he was in the truck in the first place. Um, the villains, okay? The villains are cartoonish, all right? Victor Maitland, uh, he works from like a very normal building, it seems, in Beverly Hills, an office park building, I guess, right? And yet he mm -hmm. presses a button and all these goons come out dressed in suits. They take Axel out of the building and they throw him out a window to sort of like, nothing to see here, folks. Just doing, you know, cool villain stuff today here on the streets of Beverly Hills, throwing people out of windows. No big deal. Uh, and just the idea of the henchman is sort of over the top in general. I mean, it's, it's just very too James Bond without being a James Bond movie, right? Uh, let's see here. I got Fair. more. I'll keep going. Keep going. Keep, no, it's, your, it's your time. All right, good. I'll keep going here. Um, this is, there's a lot of points in this next part, which is that nothing makes sense. It just, none of it makes sense to begin with. So he doesn't seem to have any money, Axel, right? He's got this piece of shit car. Doesn't seem to have any money. He just pulls up to a hotel in Beverly Hills. It's fancy. 
And uh, he just says, yeah, this will do. And he starts ordering room service. In reality, he would be staying in like a rat motel in Long Beach, okay? This, that made no sense why he was like, yeah, sure, this is cool. Even if he did get the better rate, it's, he still wouldn't have done it. Like that made zero sense at all. Uh, the German bearer bonds and the cocaine front didn't make sense. Uh, it, I, I get the bearer bonds was a way to bring Mikey into this and to have him killed, uh, which they did completely nonchalantly. They're like, oh, hey, we're just up in this apartment and uh, we're just going to put two in the back of this guy's head and we're not going to run. We're not going to take off real fast. We're just going to kind of mosey. Oh, hey, look, Detroit, cool city, you know? They just did not seem to be in a rush to get out of there or worry about being seen at all. Um, so, but yet when, when Axel and Jen are in the warehouse, they do that, uh, that super villain, I'm going to talk to you first and tell you what I'm going to do to you, which is just horseshit. Uh, let's see here. Uh, they it's very, the- very James, very James Bondish as well. Yeah. When he, tells, when he tells you the plot of the, what they're going to do. It's all that. They lie to the chief at the end, right? And the chief, like, like, well, we were doing this thing with uh, Detroit PD as though the chief wouldn't have any idea that there's this crazy involvement with another jurisdiction from another state for some big undercover thing. He's like, oh, okay, well, that must be true then. Uh, that made no sense. Also, what does any of this have to do with the Beverly Hills PD? This is drugs and bonds and customs. This is not in their jurisdiction. <laughs> they point. should give zero fucks about any of this. Okay, so this has nothing to do with Beverly Hills PD, let alone LAPD. This is for the feds to worry about. Okay, uh, you're a sticker for law enforcement, are you? I kind of am. I come from a law <laughs> enforcement family. <laughs> um, so let's see here. My uh, let's see the bad guys. They're just really bad at being bad guys. The shootout at the house. Okay. He apparently hired stormtroopers to kill people on his property. (laughs) They have machine guns and they can't hit anything. And in fact, one of the shots, they're spraying them with machine gun fire. And then all of a sudden the angle of the, of the, of the shots comes from a different angle. Like they should be dead. They should all be dead. Uh, Axel and all those guys, but nobody gets hit yet. uh, Yeah. What's his name? Billy, Uh, Billy, what's it? Rosewood. Rosewood. He, he from like what sixty yards with one shot from a revolver, he takes out a guy with a machine gun, no problem. Sure, machine guns couldn't take him out, but all of a sudden Billy's the hero here. But that happens um, in how many action movies? Fucking Arnold galore, Stallone galore. Doesn't make it right. Doesn't par make for, it right. Par par for the course. Just spring that up. Sure, if that if that makes you feel good. Um, let's see. <laughs> None of Axel's ploys would work, okay? The way he gets the hotel room, he's like flexing Rolling Stone. Uh, like, oh, sure, you're a writer. Come on in. Let me give you the, the, the suite for no price at all. That wouldn't work. Um, let's see. The going into the, what's it called? The, uh, the, 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 the place with all the, the cargo where he goes in there and he says- oh, the warehouse. Uh, the, bond, the bond warehouse. Hey, yeah, thank you, the bond warehouse. Okay, oh, hey, go get your supervisor. Yeah, that doesn't work. Uh, it wasn't funny. It was stupid. Uh, it didn't make any sense. Uh, yeah, he was faking to be a customs agent or something. That's not going to happen. The country club scene, BSing his way in. Although I did like Herpes Simplex 10. That was yeah. funny. Credit where credit is due. That was still a ridiculous thing when he just like pulls up in his dumper car and nobody bats an eye. And even the valet is like, all right, cool. I guess I'll just go ahead and park this thing. Uh also, uh, the transformation of Billy into some sort of loyal super cop to Axel. At the end, they're about to go in the house, and he says, I'm sorry, Sarge. I got to. No, you don't got to, Billy. You don't have to do anything. Call it in over the radio and do literally anything else. He didn't have to do anything. Uh, Mikey had it coming. He brought this on himself. He stole shit from bad men, and all these people risked a lot. To help this idiot? No, they'd be like, oh, Mikey was an idiot. He stole some stuff and he got whacked. It happens. Uh, let's see. And I think that's about it. I could also say that the strip club scene was really ham-fisted. Like, they're in this place. Everything's cool. And then he's like, ooh, hey, I think this place is about to be robbed by these two guys who were also taking in the show first, which I did appreciate before they <laughs> robbed the place. They're like, I mean, look, we're going to steal something. But before that, let's you know get a song or two in. But... Philip, man, is that you? You change. 
changed. You changed, man. <laughs> so, okay. So anyway, the shotgun goes off uh, in that scene. Nobody runs. Everybody's cool. And then uh, Taggart is sort of like, all right, everybody, as you were, enjoy the titties. You know, like nothing, nothing to see here. Nothing just happened. A gun did not just go off in a strip club. Uh, and again, that's actually kind of a, I already told you about the Kung Fu movie. So that was going to be my transition into Kung Fu and titties, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> if Bronson Pichot is Serge would have jumped out in the strip bar and fought one of those motherfuckers, threw it a <laughs> lemon espresso with a little twist in his face, I would have lost my shit. I actually like the Serge character. He was, and which is probably why they kept him in the next two. And you guys do he was know not, he was not in the second one. He wasn't? Are you nope. sure? Nope. nope. Was he in three? Might have been. I saw three in the theater when he came out when I was in high school, and it was trash. I don't think I've seen it. I might have seen it once. I don't remember. He definitely was not in two. Two is on cable nonstop. And okay, I, yeah. I think I saw that he was at least in one more of them. Yeah. And you know they're making a fourth. Yeah, they found yeah. a director for. I think yesterday I read for it was. Yeah, a, it's, and I think it's for director, Netflix. Yeah, the director found out he was a director yesterday too. I know nothing about what he's ever done, but good for him. And that is it. That is why uh, Beverly Hills Cop is a bad bad movie give me a number one to ten it's a four mm -hmm. kevin israel lead off oh okay all right so this movie does a lot of things that we've seen many times before and we've seen many times after the, the plot of this movie isn't complicated you know a cop from a rough town's friend gets killed he's got to go into an upscale place and throw around his you know, gunslinging style and try to solve, solve the murder. And that's all fine. This was this whole movie. And it's interesting that this movie was originally going to be starred by uh, Sylvester Stallone. And I would love to, I wonder if that script exists on the yes, internet somewhere. It, yes, it does. You know what it's called? Cobra. Right. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even joking. Like that's the framework was Cobra for Beverly really? Hills Cup. Yeah. That's oh, why you see in cop two, you have the Rambo and the Cobra posters in his bedroom, Billy's bedroom. Oh, that's really funny. Yeah. You're the disease. I'm the cure. I'm the cure. Um, so, but this movie just feels like it was a vehicle for Eddie Murphy. Like they, they were like, all right, just do your thing. Here's a script with, you know, a few words per page, a few directions. Just go be Eddie Murphy through this whole thing. And I got to tell you, Eddie Mur and I just and I think we, we we talked about this recently. I just watched uh, Eddie Murphy Raw, and he's a fucking force of nature. Like mm -hmm. he is so incredibly charming and likable. And even I mean, he was you know in that comedy special, he says shit that would get you canceled forever today. Like you would never. He would do that show and then he would have to disappear from the earth forever because you could never get away with saying half of that shit. He, I think he, he, I think he starts talking about how, you know, the F words are looking at his ass. Don't, and you got to keep moving around. Don't look. Woo, 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 woo. Yeah. By the way, just so you guys know, I first watched that with my brother and my grandparents uh, when we were visiting them in Florida as little kids, we thought that it, we, Eddie Murphy was such a star <laughs> And we thought, oh, we want to see this. And they had no idea. And we watched a little bit of Raw before my grandfather turned it off. I That's thought you were going to say before he died. I was gonna say, I'll, I'll, tra I'll, I'll trade a story with you, Jarrett. My, my parents took my sister, 16 year at the time, because I told them this movie is fucking hilarious. Did not know they were going to take my sister to go see American Pie. Ooh, uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> very much so. And, uh, and speaking, speaking of delirious and Raw, there's a scene where he's <laughs> he's walking down the street in Beverly Hills when he first gets there, and these two guys walk by in complete leather outfits, dressed yeah. up like Michael Jackson, and he laughs at them. Meanwhile, that's what he wore in his two comedy specials <laughs> that made oh, him that's so an famous. Point though, what came out first? This delirious, the delirious. Then this. Then Raw so was, was that, eighty-seven. Was that sort of poking fun at himself a little bit there? I'd have to think he was aware of. I think they were supposed to be dressed like Michael Jackson, but yeah. I think he yeah. had to be aware of. It, it was more Michael Jackson because he just came from the hotel saying, I'm here for Michael Jackson, blah, blah, blah. You're not letting any mm, in this hotel. It tapped in the, the scene before that when he mentions Michael Jackson. I got to lean Michael Jackson. I don't think this film is super meta where it's going to go poke back to two years ago, harken back to, excuse me, where he wore the blue suit on, uh, or is it red? Red was delirious, blue was raw. I think so. 
Blue was I, blue was raw, red was delirious. Yeah, right. Yeah, I don't think he's. I don't think the director is going to harken back. I think it was all Michael Jackson being. It was just yeah. the previous scene. I think it was even more just look at the absurdity of people on the West Coast in California. Right, which still goes to my point. That's what you wore on stage. Um, <laughs> anyway, yep. this the the movie does do certain thing that it it certain things that really struck me as eighties movies, maybe even into the nineties that they don't really do in movies anymore. They don't play radio songs during movies anymore no like all those songs that jared mentioned like during this chase and there was a couple others they don't do that anymore you get maybe radio songs or a song that's going to be a radio song in the trailers of movies but you don't get you don't get those featured songs anymore in fact i almost the last the last movie that i can really remember that did it is terminator 2 with you uh with uh you, you could be, be mine and roses yeah, they they had well no they had a lot of other songs they were doing soundtracks and it's a shame I love soundtracks because you got so, so many I. different B sides yep. I mean Judgment Night holy shit what a oh, Judgment Night's amazing The Crow another monster one soundtracks the last ready for this one the last great soundtrack Imho is uh, Tron Legacy because it's all Daft Punk doing the instrumental score shit while yeah. Tron's doing Tron shit but other yeah, than that sounds really good I have to check that out it's great. I love it, and, but you're right. I so miss soundtracks. Uh, I I couldn't even tell you if I look at my iTunes. It's probably close to one third, maybe twenty five percent of my entire library, which is insane. Yeah, yeah, but and so you don't get you don't get that anymore. No, and it you, don't. it you know it just shows you how the music industry's changed, and even rock and roll has changed. Like rock and roll songs used to be featured prominently in movies, and you know. And anyway, besides my old ranting that rock and roll is dead um the the i i have to agree with jared the action in this movie is is painful it's it's really rough to watch and i feel and 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 it shows almost that that eddie murphy came in with very little time to prepare for the movie because at no point does he seem like he's capable of doing what he's supposed to be doing when he flips that guy over the table the guy comes and he flips him over the table it looks like he was surprised that it happened like he doesn't look confident in in being a badass and even when he has a gun and he's walking around that's that's how i feel like i would look if i was walking around with a gun <laughs> like i have no idea what i'm doing with this thing i think this is how i'm supposed to hold it this is how i've seen other people hold it so this is what i'm gonna do the and the end gun fight is absurd it is absolutely absurd. It feels, it, it feels almost like somebody made a spoof of a gunfight from the eighties because there, whenever they show Eddie Murphy shooting at somebody, you're, it's, it never feels like he's actually shooting at the person that ends up getting hit. Like they show him and somebody over here falls, but don't worry, we'll deal with that in post. They got all the angles wrong at every moment. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. It, there, there was, I think, a lot of, a lot of editing issues. The bad guy in this, Maitland, is terrible. He's just a, a terrible bad guy with his with with motivation that I don't even really. Get. If you're that like, a but guy he's so that... great in Rambo: First Blood Part Two. <laughs> Night Raven to Lone Wolf. But you know what? And he is he is he is good at being creepy and intimidating and all of that. But it didn't work in this movie. Because his mo like he was an art dealer who I guess was importing stuff. It's not really clear what he was importing. Maybe drugs, maybe not. Like Jared said, with the bonds and everything, I don't know. But he just never felt he never felt really threatening. And then he had this muscle, like his his henchman, his chief henchman, who was fucking useless. That guy didn't. That guy, other than killing Mikey in the beginning, he everything he did went wrong. He, Do you know he, who that is? By the way, do you both know who that is? You know what? I felt like I should know who he was, and then I just never looked it up. He's on the greatest show ever made in the history of television, Breaking Bad. That's Mike from Breaking Bad. Oh, wow. Get the hell out of here. Yep. And also in Better Call Saul, which I've, as we tape this, premieres tonight, and that's the tonight, first thing I'm yeah. doing. I am watching when we're done these podcasts. Wait, wow. the main henchman is Mike Ermintrout? Yes, it is. With hair? With, well, yeah. Very, you see it's going, right? Well, you see where he is now. Yes, that's Mike from Breaking Bad. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah, now. you know what? I can, now that you say it, I can see it. He was terrible. He was, used, <laughs> he, should been, he should have been fired. As soon as he got flipped over the buffet table, I thought that it, it would have made sense if Maitland like killed him 
or fired him or something like make Maitland a bad guy. He wasn't, he never felt like this really threatening bad guy. And there was never, I don't know. I just never felt like there were any stakes in this. And that, and if you, if you're going to have an action movie like this, and I, and this might be like the first sort of buddy cop comedy, I think this might've been the predecessor. I can't, I can't think of anything before this. Yeah. To this like level. This was, this was probably the predecessor to all of those, you know, the, the fucking, the, the later movies and the, 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 the chemistry between, I liked the, um, I liked the chemistry between Eddie Murphy and, um, why well, am I blanking on his name? Bogomo. The guy that I'm dressed up as over Taggart. here. Taggart. Taggart. I really, I, I, be, I believed them. I believed that relationship. I didn't believe him. Rosewood. And I didn't know Rosewood. I didn't, I don't get what, who he was supposed to be. Was he supposed to be this like young, idealistic, like cop? Was he supposed to be this? Like, I want to be an action. Like, like, I hate that. I'm, I'm so by the book. I want to do more exciting action. So was that his thing? Like, well, that's was, no, no, no. That was part two where he becomes a full blown, like action junkie. If you remember yeah. part two, this one, I don't remember I, part this, two at all. This one is the first, this one is, was that, you hit the nail on the head. Young, idealistic cop trying to do good. And then Axel coaxes him to, to finally see the evidence that's being presented and, you know, coaxes him to follow him. And I've but I just never felt day. like maybe it's because of how he looks or I never felt that he looked as young or as naive as he was supposed to be. Like, he, I don't feel like he he embodied that part. Look, all of that said, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen this movie. <laughs> I love this movie. <laughs> Why? And it's solely Why? it's solely because of Eddie Murphy. This is a this is a movie that proves if you have a charming enough, charismatic enough lead character, he can carry the movie. And Eddie Murphy, and that's why Eddie Murphy was the most bankable star for so many years. And even when he made so many shitty movies, Hollywood kept throwing money at him because they were like, he like this was a shit this. Beverly Hills Cop without Andy Murphy is a terrible movie. It's a terrible movie. It's not a good cop movie. It's not a good action movie. It's not a good mystery. There's no twist in it. There's not even a twist in it. Like we're about to do Speed. Even Speed has a little twist in it. This doesn't have anything. This just ends with the with him. You know, the the, the chief and Eddie shooting the guy and killing him. Like that's it. That's the, end many, of the movie but, ends. But then were there many twists in cop films previous to this? I don't. No, think no, no, so. no. But I'm just I'm just saying. There's right. plot wise, everything else wise. There's not a lot to this movie. This movie is Eddie Murphy. This whole movie is made up by Eddie Murphy. You and you you, you take him out of it, you, you have maybe an average, maybe a subpar cop movie. But with him in it, it just shows how great of a star he was. And it almost it almost makes you bad when you see all the other shit he ended up doing because he, he fell so hard. But fuck, this was such this and 48 hours, just such and he's basically it's the same character. I mean, he's the same character. It's not like it's not like in trading places too. Yeah, I, right. But at right. the same time, did you ever legitimately like guffaw? Did you laugh out loud? No, I, you know what? And I don't think I wouldn't. I wouldn't go as far as say this is the funniest movie. This is like a hysterical movie, but it's a fucking likable movie, it's and likable. it just shows He's how like, Eddie. Right, but but this movie to me, this movie it might as well be just called Eddie Murphy Cop, like because <laughs> that's what that's what it is. You're just following Eddie Murphy around, loving everything he does, and if you and if you watch Eddie Murphy's in almost every scene. There's no scenes that don't have Eddie Murphy in them because he is the movie. <laughs> and that, that really speaks to, you know, like when, like when I read novel, like when I read novels, if I really like the main character and I don't like anybody else in the book, it ruins it for me because there's other, there's, you know, there'll be chapters where the main character is not in the story and it drags. This movie takes that whole problem and throws it in the garbage because I put Eddie Murphy in almost every scene. So it, it, he's just such a powerhouse in this movie that I, I, and I agree, Jared, I agreed with literally everything you said, except Eddie Murphy makes this a great movie. <laughs> Eddie I mean, Murphy makes it a watchable movie. It doesn't make it great. We're going to see how great, like, we're going to see how great it is. Give me a number. Uh, seven to 10. Aha. Seven? Seven. Good Christ. These right. notes brought to you by guttingthesacredcow.com. And of course, if you want to advertise with us like you're about to hear, 
Cutting the sacred cow at gmail.com. But of course, our buddies at Athletic Greens, boy, they can't do any wrong, can they, Kevin Israel? No, There's something can. that we can all agree on. Athletic Greens every day, like clockwork, cold glass of water, just like you do. And I chug that. No, I don't chug it. I enjoy it casually. A nice sipping drink. Mix it in there. You know why? Because I love how it helps regulate gut health. I love how it's keto, paleo, vegan, dairy, and gluten-free and contains less than one gram of sugar. What are your what's your what's your favorite thing about athletic greens that you tell your friends about while you're drinking something that's green and goes, wait, what is that you're drinking? What's your favorite thing you tell them? That it tastes good. Yeah. There's tons of there's tons of products out there that have the vitamins and the minerals and the nutrients in them, or you can combine them, but they all taste like shit. Yep. Being able to take one drink in the morning kicks your day off. It tastes good. You don't have to be terrified of look of drinking it. The worst thing in the morning is waking up and having to drink something bad. It tastes good. It's easy. It's got everything you need in it. It's a it's a great way to start the day. It supports mental clarity and awareness so that we can start your day off right without having a shotgun, a cup of coffee, which costs less than a cup of coffee. It costs less than three bucks a day. You're investing in your ha- in your in your health more importantly than just a caffeine fix. This is a small micro habit with big benefits. It's something easy you can do every day to take great care of yourself. Now, don't forget it also has over seven thousand five star reviews recommended by professional athletes and leading health experts like Tim Ferriss and Michael Gervais. Of course, when you go to athleticgreens.com slash GTSC, you're going to get one year free vitamin D and five free travel packs to take with you wherever you go on a trip. Athleticgreens.com slash GTSC. Athleticgreens.com slash GTSC. Notes. After the Imperial March, the Star Wars theme, Indiana Jones and Jaws. This is the fifth most recognizable and ubiquitous movie theme out there. Axel Foley theme. People hum this shit nonstop. People made this, made this the ringer on their cell phone. My hand is in the air for a long time and will continue to do so. I disagree with you, Jared. This is a sneaky good soundtrack. I have three fucking songs in the soundtrack on my phone. The Neutron Dance is catchy as shit. Axel Foley. I have... Probably, if I look right now, I probably have eight or nine remixes of the Axel Foley theme alone. I know I'm weird. I love the opening scene of the cigarette truck. That, that whole dialogue with the cigarette part, I love it. it. Yes, it does go on a little bit too long, but it, it's just so iconic for me. I think this film perfected the volcanic relationship between movie cops, movie captains, excuse me, and that loose cannon cop. Inspector Todd is the best superior officer I have seen in any cop film. I fucking love him. He is a ball buster, takes no shit, he, but you can see he cares. There is a difference. It's a genuine love, and like, we, like Kevin said, we're about to do speed. The commander in speed is a piece of shit. All he does is yell, <laughs> yell, 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 bark, bark, bark. I love Inspector Todd. He is funny as shit, and he got off in part three, which I hated. Because, well, part three is a terrible film. We'll get to that another day. No, we won't, because that film would not qualify for this podcast. Michael Tandino is very quick to whip out those bonds and show Axel. I would have waited at least four drinks and two games of pool to whip out some bonds and brag on that shit. Uh, I, but I guess they had to get all these exposi- these key exposi- uh, exposition points out to get the movie in under 100 minutes. So, hey, here we go. Guess what? I'm out of jail. Oh, look what I got. See what I got? I stole these. Huh? Want some? Want some? No? Okay, cool. <laughs> all right. I've been drunk many a time. Very many a time. I know I've missed on a ton of verbal, verbal and physical cues from the latter sex. But one thing I know I would not miss, no matter how annihilated I have been, I would not miss two hitmen three feet from my apartment door. How the <laughs> fuck How the fuck did they not see those two guys right there? I mean, he puts his key in the lock, and it's not even a half a Mississippi. Clang, that guy, down goes Eddie Murphy, and he's got Mikey pinned up against the wall. They're standing right. They're standing a pubic hair outside of frame. This doesn't happen. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> You're out of cue, God damn it, please. <laughs> Off you. Anyone else believing that a shitty four Nova made a, a trip two thirds across this great country of ours? Me neither. Thank you. I'm not even the car guy, and I called that. Yeah, I had that as a note, and I didn't. Did you? I, I left it out, yeah. That thing never crossed the Michigan state line. <laughs> <laughs> this looks like the same hotel as they shot Bachelor Party in, the downstairs lobby exterior i'm not googling to confirm i'm just relying on old faithful my brain 
Let's do some math. $235 for a single room at the Beverly Hills Hotel is $647 in today's money. That's a pretty fair price for a hotel there. $650 a night. Some Vegas hotels are that price. I know I'm staying at one. That's even more obscene considering he got a suite for that price, by the way. Show off. I should tell you, I, I want to hang myself for paying this amount of money. I had a knockoff Michael Jackson in the uh, Jackson jacket in the first grade with zippers, but not not as cool as those. I wish I had that jacket now for someone. Did you really? Reason. It was all black, but not uh, like leather pay money shiny. To see that. I, I would too. I was Hollywood. <laughs> I'm sure my mom has picture somewhere. All zippers, but not like shiny, flashy leather. It was like whatever basic jacket material if that's not your facebook profile picture in the next month i'll be very disappointed <laughs> i have to find it uh, i've seen many people thrown out of bars myself included for uh many times but never have seen someone thrown out of a flimsy window of an office building no it seems well, glass doesn't glass doesn't break like that no you would bounce off right hard. yes and if it breaks it breaks in pieces right it doesn't just turn to sand right yeah, this that's tempered glass, so hold on now. <laughs> yeah. This seems a bit excessive, kind of like ordering Indian food and buffalo wings on a first date. You just don't do that. Axel, you said it, Jared. Axel's very cavalier about spending money when he's when he's on a Detroit cop salary. I wonder how this is gonna pay off. <laughs> I don't give a shit how many times I've seen this movie. I always always laugh at the banana in the tailpipe scene and the wink the waiter gives back and forth. That that always gets me. I love when he still fucks with the custom agents. Yes, it's all horse shit. But when he just digs in, and whose porch? Is that your porch outside? I go, no, that's not my porch. We got nothing to worry about then. I <laughs> gets me every time. We should all be so lucky to have a surge at each of our jobs. He'd make meetings more fun with his carefree lifestyle and cutesy poo accent. So do you remember the guy who comes in next to him who has this shirt open? Yes, and yells at him for the shirt being open. He was supposed to have more lines, is something I read earlier, but Serge was so good and such a likable character. They're like, screw it, you get all the lines. I wonder what gay alternative, well, sorry, I wonder what alternative universe we could be in where we can enjoy a romantic tale between Damon Wayans gay buffet character and Serge. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that, like all of these semi-famous, late, you know, later to be famous actors had to be gay in this movie. <laughs> Do you remember who was in part two of the up and coming comics? I have, I haven't seen part two. I think I've seen part two once and I barely remember it. Gilbert Gottfried and Chris Rock. Oh, rest in peace. Uh, speaking of comedian, I thought Paul Reiser was actually and really Reiser. good yeah. for the 90 seconds he was in it. This was a really early film for him. Yeah. I'll get to that. The timing is good. I'll get to that. Uh-oh. Victor Maitland's house. If you guys are fans of Entourage, Vinny Chase and the boys live there for a few seasons. Did you know that? Go back and watch. I, I love Entourage. Well, you did too, Kevin. I did. I did. Yep. That, it's one of their houses they lived in. I still crack up when Bill yells, drop it, and Taggart yells, he goes, if you ever do that again, I'll shoot you myself. <laughs> I'll shoot you. <laughs> That's my mother's favorite line of this. It's no, sequ it's no secret how many times on this podcast I enjoy this film because how many quotes have I used to stump Israel? Successfully, I might add, on this. The characters in this film are pinnacle in the buddy cop franchise. I'll take Rosewood, Taggart, and Foley against Murtaugh and Riggs any day of the week. Mm. Lethal, Weapon, Lethal Weapon 2 and 3, 1 and 2 are great. 3 and 4 are trash. But I love Cop 1 and 2. The, the charisma, the all you said that about Eddie Murphy is true. But I love the chemistry that these guys have in this film. Specifically, I know Part 2 we're not going to discuss. This is Eddie Murphy's best role by far. Coming to America is highly overrated. We did in this podcast. It does not. It's The jokes aren't there. Now, I will say this. This film, I, remember, I thought, had more jokes than when I saw it the upteenth number of times. Not as many jokes as I remember. But Eddie Murphy is beyond lovable. He has the comedic chops down. I think he kind of whittled away all the, the rough edges with 48 Hours and um, Trading Places. He sells himself as an undercover cop, Detroit guy. I, yes, everything you said is completely true. All the nuances, all the horse shit, all the that doesn't happen. I wish we got a little bit more Inspector Todd and Jeffrey, because I love those two. But the sequel, you get them in there, and I like the sequel. The soundtrack, the score, fantastic. Uh, this film is still rock solid. It aces the remote test, Jared. Of course, the remote test being at any point you catch a film, you immediately just, uh, drop the remote and go, well, I know what I'm doing for the next hour, hour and a half, whatever. This is going to be, this is in my top 25. I absolutely still love it. Seven and a half out of 10. I, I 
love this. Absolutely love it. Critics, five-star reviews. It's a good detective story. It's got a great bad guy. I don't agree with that. It's got a motivated hero. It's a fun movie that moves and doesn't stop. Although Murphy is a one-man comedy, one-man army comedian, the chemistry between Bully, Rosewood, and Taggart truly make the movie hilarious. A work of racial subversion that's both hilarious and cathartic. Hmm. I don't think so. Wasn't no, much. Not buying that. No, no, not not much racial aspect of that, except for the Rolling Stone Axel Foley reporter, where he screams and says, "I'm being, you know, ousted because I'm black of the hotel." That's it. But critics trying to work that in there. Kevin is real guilty again when it's not there. Eddie, this is my favorite one. Eddie Murphy's Axel Foley is a gay cop out to serve the murder, serve, out to solve the murder of an ex-lover. Twenty years of hindsight shows Axel Foley to be a great gay icon of '80s pop culture. <laughs> you know, he never did try to make a move on Jen. You know, it's funny that you say that, Jared, because I didn't remember the movie specific enough, and for some reason, I thought they ended up having. I thought they had a sex scene together, and by the end of the movie, I'd forgotten all about that. If he's gay, why is he going to a strip club to see titties? He was trying to fit in with the guys, with the other cops. Well, why? He's going out there. Goes, I'm going here. If you want to follow me, you follow me. They could have been like, fuck you. We're not going to follow he you. knew they were going to go. Mm, me, why, 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 not, why not make it awkward for them? Why not take him to a gay strip club then? Really, I don't think Foley was gay. But anyway. <laughs> I, I, I don't either. That's what I'm trying to argue. <laughs> yeah. Murphy exudes the kind of cheeky, cocky charm that has been missing from the screen since Cagney was a pup snarling his way out of the ghetto. What the fuck? That's... Who wrote this? James Cagney's great-granddaughter? Cagney. Amazon one-star reviews. Loud, long, and vulgar. They're describing Kevin Israel's act, I see. <laughs> An hour and 40? Is that too long? No, it's not. A way God, I for... wish there was more hour 40 long movies. Right? Seriously. Away from Murphy's iconic comic status and star quality at the time, he was a limited dramatic actor, making almost unattainable the tauter moments of the plot. It's a cop comedy, you dickhead. <laughs> this is why no one should pay attention to critics ever. Be begin charting the legendarily steep decline of Murphy as a conversation worth having outside the tabloids. <laughs> this was the goddamn fucking pinnacle. What is this person saying? Raw, cop two, some can argue, but I'm, I'm not a fan. Harlem Knights. Then you can say Boomerang was the beginning of the end of Western civilization. You can argue that. Distinguished Gentleman, did not like. Vampire in Brooklyn, we all know where that went. And then, of course, we hit the Pluto Nash, Beverly Hills Cop three years, and uh, him picking up a, 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 a transsexual with a, a feet fetish. But good or bad movies, they were still, you know, lining up the Brinks truck at his house. Right. Oh, so, yeah. He was getting, you know? what, 20, 25? Was he getting 25 mil then at the time? I don't know, but he's at least getting 15, 20. If and that's those, a downfall of yeah. a career, I'll take it. Whoops. Know? Oh, yeah, and then he that. and then he had the chart topping single was up, was up, was up with you. Don't Who could forget that. that? How could you forget that? Oh, what was, oh I want to party all party the time. All the time. Party party my all girl the time. wants to Dude. party all the time. Yep. yep. Expectation. Yeah, we didn't. <laughs> we're all doing it right now. Expectation that expect, expectation that Eddie Murphy's street brand of rebelliousness would devastate Stade and glittery Beverly Hills are not entirely met in a film that grows increasingly dramatic. Words, 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 words. It has a creamy surface and junky insides. So they say about Kevin's dick. Yeah. Or a Mars bar, which is which are both disgusting. Amazon five star reviews. <laughs> As an underprivileged child, you just never see yourself hanging out in Beverly, Beverly Hills or areas at age 16. Once I went to college, I toured all the film locations seen in the movie. It was a joy to real joy to reminisce about the scenes in the movie while seeing the locations in real life. Good job, team. 
Way to make a movie review about yourself, you underprivileged piece of shit. Just because your parents could afford Beverly Hills like 99.9% of everybody else doesn't mean you're underprivileged, you selfish twat. Jeez. That had to be all about him. They, I was underprivileged. I couldn't go see Beverly Hills. Yes, stop it. No one could afford it. That's why it's the one tenth of 1% there. Also, I don't even know why that's an interesting review of the movie. Because he wanted to make it about, no. You know why I chose it. Uh, I cut and paste. So Edie Murphy, I guess uh, Eddie's cousin, Edie Murphy is great in this movie because he the fact that he is from Detroit, a once thriving city, hope it will come back to us, as Flint is my hometown. And you've heard about the water problem there, but GM pulling all their auto plants out of that city is what caused the real crash. Love Jamie Lee Curtis in this film for all the eye candy. All this, all in, all in and all this is a great movie. What? <laughs> Did this person think Jamie Lee Curtis was Balky from Perfect Strangers? Is that the problem? <laughs> that review went a lot of places. Yeah, that was all over the place. If you thought that had one, my VHS tape had water damage, and I had to update to DVD. Damn it. Good written, story. Written in 2021. Let's also mind you. One of Eddie Murphy's greatest movies. VHS had water so, yeah, August 21. I hope this guy gets the Best Buy real soon and gets a digital antenna and gets rid of those rabbit ears real fast. Murphy at the top of his game, an almost, an almost believable story built around the style of humor with a supporting cast that makes it work well. If you haven't seen it before, this is well worth a trip back in time. And if you have seen it before, it is well worth watching again. Did that person really write an almost believable story? Yes. They still believe in Santa. What do you wait? What? He's they Jewish. Just... He's Jewish, Jared. Let it go. So am I. <gasps> Bellini is Jewish. I know. I, I get to like when I get to sneak by because of my one of those name. Italian Jews. One of those oh. Italian Jews. So where are they call wow. a pizza bagel. <laughs> oh, I know now I know two of you. Yeah. On a side note, lots of luck trying to get the theme song out of your head. Maybe I don't want to get out of my head. All right, maybe I don't want to get out of my head. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. Had it on VHS and it broke, LOL. <laughs> Amazon one star reviews. Great movie over 30 years old. Amazon Prime movies reviews. should get these, Amazon Prime members should get these types of movies for free. They like the movie, but he wanted it for free. Very obscene, signed Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> <laughs> we watch 15 minutes and then tr toss the dvd in the trash that didn't happen writers must not have had much imagination there are other words in the english language than curse words this movie had the excessive use of the f word i know it was rated r and expected some rough language but this was way over the top no over the top was a 1987 film with stallone about arm wrestling and truck driving you know what? I don't even think that there was that much cursing in it, was there? By some so, of today's standards? so we're from Jersey. This th that this doesn't affect us because we're so used to it. It doesn't right. stand out. But these are the same people who, write, if they if someone says "God damn" in a in a movie, they write in the Amazon review, "How dare they take the Lord's name in vain?" So one "God damn" will send people off the you know the same type of people who put an Easter bunny in a noose outside of a Waffle House in Atlanta. Yes, that happened. I saw it with my own eyes. Oh, you guys saw what I did? <laughs> <laughs> Next one. Uh, to be fair, I only watched about the first 10 minutes. There was way too much cursing, which detracted from the movie, and I did not continue to watch it. I like the actor. I watched many fun, decent movies with him, but this one, yeah. I had to turn it off after the first few minutes. Every character uses the four-letter word in almost in every sentence. Movies should be entertaining and educational. This one is neither. I'm so sad to see Edie Murphy produce and promote something like this. I will never watch his movies again. I wonder if this reviewer learned about vampires from Vampires in Brooklyn, and I think they learned about commodities from Trading Places. Oh. And of course, not learning, also learning to whip that pussy and not be pussy whipped from Boomerang. It's no dinner with my dinner with Andre. <laughs> Missed this huge 80s hit until now. It's terrible. Except for Eddie Murphy's laugh, which why was this movie a phenomenon because of that? I don't get it. 
features the usual Keystone cops take, but this time it's the Beverly Hills police force made to look like they would know crime if it hit it over, hit them over the head. Yeah, it's Beverly Hills. No crime goes on there, you idiots. Comple- unless it's white collar crime or people stealing. I guess it does. Completely unrealistic until the end, right when the chief doesn't believe the ultra violent shootout that just happened was called for. I laughed twice when the, one of the villains would gets thrown to the salad bar and when Eddie Murphy stuffs three bananas into a squad car's tailpipe. The rest, sterile at best. Kevin Israel, did Jared Bellini gut the sacred cow? Jared, thank you so much for coming on the show. You are awesome. <laughs> And you, I, ag- I agreed with 99.9% of what you said, which is so weird because I don't think you did gut it. Mm. You got so close. You made, you made a lot of awesome points that I do agree with, but I just think Eddie Mur- Murphy's just a fucking juggernaut. And, uh, and this was him at his best. That's a pretty high, that's a, guys, that's a pretty high bar. You did a great job. I agree with all your points, but you didn't do it. I, look, you, you know what? There have been girls that I wanted to go out with that were like, listen, I like you. I think you're cute. You're funny, but I just, I'm just not going to go out with you. You don't be like, why? So I'm sorry to make you feel like that. Yeah. We could be, we we could be friends, right? (laughs) Hey, is your friend, is your friend Mark single? (laughs) (laughs) Well, that that one always hurt, right? Jared, tell the folks what you're up to again, where we can find you, what you're working on. Uh, you can just find me. Like I said, I'm, I'm guy on Twitter. I'm uh, at Jared Bellini and I do a lot of photography on the side and that's what keeps him busy. Has Nothing anyone special, has anyone told you like a much skinnier version of Brian Pussain? Uh, no, but I have heard Louis CK in the past. Oh, I don't see I a plan. I don't see a plan. Oh, it's Harvey Weinstein. Never mind. Yeah. I think I write female comics. <laughs> <laughs> We don't know if he has his pants on, so. Yeah. Oh, he's got the plan. That's hilarious. Awesome. Kevin Israel, what's up with you, pal? Uh, check me out at kevinisrael.com for upcoming comedy dates. I got a pretty busy calendar, uh, April and May, uh, and June is filling up nicely. Also, check out my album, The Struggle is Real, on iTunes and everywhere you get stuff. And make sure to leave us a five-star rating and a quick sentence review, a few-sentence review on your podcast platform of choice, Kevin Goatee does you the honor of recognizing the best reviews we get and we love them and we like to feature them on Twitter. So if you leave us something extra special, nice, we'll do something extra special, nice for you. That's a win-win. Kevin go t.com for shenanigans, gutting the sacred cow.com. And of course, gutting the sacred cow at gmail.com. If you want to reach out just to say, hi, how are you? And of course, as well as advertise with us, make sure you go over of course, to athleticgreens.com slash GTSC. Find us on the metaverse. That's right. The joke community room. When you're not too busy jerking off with a virtual reality uh, helmet on, you can go and watch our show there. So check that out. Check us out there. Subscribe to us on YouTube. That doesn't hurt. So tell your friends, for Christ's sakes. Tell your friends how funny this is and the show, how much you'll love it. We know you do. Just share the word. Jared Bellini, you're a joy. You're a treat. Thank you for coming on our fine little vehicle. We'll see all you folks later. Take care. Thanks, guys. This was fun.